All right. Hello. Good morning there. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are across the world. Uh, this is Dr. John McDougall. And in the interest of bringing experts to you, not only about your personal health, which is, of course, very important to you, I know, but as, as far as our future goes, I have brought an expert who is, uh, well, he's been at this for as long as I have in terms of trying to help people as individuals. And we'll see what kind of thoughts he has on saving our new patient, which is uh, planet Earth. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Michael Clapper, MD, a longtime friend. Michael, do you remember when we first met? I, I will never forget that day. And maybe I have the wrong day in mind, but what is your memory about how, ba how far back it goes that we met? Oh my, uh, well, I first heard you before I met you. I was in Florida, this was 1983, and you were being inter interviewed on an Orlando radio station. And I had just become vegan a year or two before, and people were asking me all sorts of medical questions. And I myself were wondering, is this a reasonable thing to do? Is this, uh, are people all going to be protein deficient? How, how do you practice medicine from a plant-based point of view? And I hear this doctor on the radio being interviewed, and what clear, powerful answers he has about reversing these terrible diseases. And then, um, yes, and our guest today has been Dr. John McDougall. And I wrote down that name, and I is the author of the McDougall Plan. And I went to, to uh, Borders, and I got a copy of the McDougal Plan. And uh, so, I, so I thank heavens there's somebody else out there with MD after their name who knows about this. So you were actually my guiding light as I first got into it, uh, and to the issues and, pro and uh, uh, situation. Uh, and then I think we then met uh, about six months later. I think it was at a vegetarian conference somewhere in the, in the Northeast, right? Yes. North, there was the North American Vegetarian Society right. meeting. And, you know, there were some painful things that I remember about that. You got up and gave a talk. And the first thing you announced is your dad was ill from yes. heart disease and actually, actually undergoing heart surgery. Indeed. And I could tell that you were a man that was... Uh, dedicated to the dietary issues and would be for your lifetime because it affected you and your family. And, and it was so mm -hmm. good to meet you, Michael. Well, thank you. Um, my dad died of clogged arteries and made me a prophet without honor in my own home and made me all the more determined to uh, get this word out to keep others from having the same fate. Well, it's been hard to change people's diets. I know my own father he had the advantage of learning the diet and living an extra 11 years, but he almost died in his, uh, in his early 70s from, uh, from coronary artery disease. And I'd worked really hard, you know, my parents, of course, I cared about greatly. And every had chance I, I had, as I bet you did, every chance I had, I tried to talk him into changing. And it wasn't until he got into serious trouble, almost dead, that he decided that he would listen. And as I say, he got 11 more years. So well, how long did it take you before you started uh, practicing medicine, Dr. Michael Clapper? You were in Florida at that time. And when did you start instituting uh, diet therapy? And I bet, I bet diet therapy is not an unusual term for you. No, it's not, but it certainly was then. And it is for most of our colleagues. We're in diet therapy. Are you working for Weight Watchers? What are you doing? And uh, so little do they know what a powerful key, what a powerful tool, diet, plant-based diet, diet therapy is to reverse so many of these diseases, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, uh, autoimmune diseases. If there was a pill that did this, we, we would be trillionaires. Uh, if we could uh, manufacture a pill that would reverse these diseases. So um, as I said, I became plant-based in 1981. Uh, and it took about another two years, about 1983, uh, I got serious about uh, that nothing else was working. And my patients who could adopt a whole food plant-based diet, uh, and I had some authority in my voice because I was doing it myself, it was stunning to me uh, and it's exciting beyond measure. The, I, I got a call from a patient who had, I had on 30 units of insulin uh, and he's telling me that uh, he's getting low blood pressure episodes you know, constantly. I said, well, cut your insulin in half, cut it in half. I'm getting down to 10 units and he's still almost blacking out from low blood sugar. And I uttered those fatal, fatal words, <laughs> fatal words that I thought on the phone that I was told never to, to utter, stop your insulin. 
<laughs> you know, because we were told once on insulin, always on insulin. Nobody got so thin. I thought there'd be a puff of smoke and the ghost of my internal medicine professor would show up and say, what did you say? Stop, it's insulin. Give me your stethoscope. You're not a doctor anymore. But I, the man no longer had diabetes. You have to stop the insulin. You're going to get hurt with, with these low blood sugars. So I saw how reversible that disease was. And within weeks, I'm getting a similar call from my patients with high blood pressure, where I've got them on two powerful medications. They're telling me when they stand up, they're getting lightheaded and almost passing out because their blood pressure is dropping to their boots. And I finally said, stop your blood pressure medication. You don't have high blood pressure anymore. What? Yes, yeah, yeah, stop your pills. And suddenly medicine got fun. People were getting healthier right before my eyes are getting leaner and normal blood pressures, normal blood sugars, stopping medications. Oh man, I couldn't wait to get to clinic every day. I still can't. It's, it's such a thrill to see patients get healthier and to stop these powerful medicines, which have their place initially, but, but no one wants to take medicines all their lives. And, and you can give them not only hope, you give them the tools to, to reverse these diseases and get off these medications with a plant-based diet. So, you know, once you look behind the curtain, you can't pretend you don't know what's behind the curtain, you know, and we, you and I both know. What, what kind of diet do you teach? I know we're very similar as far as our recommendations, but uh, what do you tell people to eat? Uh, well, so as long as it grew out of the ground and you can re recognize it by name, there, there's a potato, there's corn, there's bean, there's green pepper, there, you can eat it. And in any, in any cuisine, any nationality you want, Mexican chilies and Asian stir fries and uh, uh, Italian uh, pastas, you know, take your pick. Um, and so it's a plant, it's a whole food plant-based diet. You want lots of vital foods, so lots of vegetables, big colorful salads, lots of uh, steamed green and yellow veggies, vegetable soups. Uh, and when it comes, but you got to supply the calories and the protein. And so the calories largely come from healthy starches, potatoes, whole grains, etc. And they all have protein. Uh, the protein deficiency thing is pretty much of a myth. But just to make sure, I want to make sure that they have those really protein-rich foods known as legumes. Uh, anything in a pot is a legume, beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils. So have a, have a scoop or two of lentil stew, a bean chili, a hummus sandwich. Uh, get those legumes in on a regular basis. So uh, it's a starch-based, uh, legume-heavy uh, diet with lots and lots of uh, fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and fruits for dessert and uh, no limits on, on portions. You, you go back for a third bowl of vegetable soup, who cares? You know, it's, uh, it's all fiber and water. It goes right out. It doesn't stick to you. It makes you nice and lean and healthy. Well, you, you, you talked about protein and that's not a problem, but, but Michael, where do you get your calcium? Where do you get my calcium? Uh, the same place you didn't cows... Milk. No, I didn't. No, and I did a lot of growing up on a dairy farm. Oh, what a what a nightmare that is. Um, but he, a valid question. But again, and people, well, you got to have cow's milk for dairy for calcium. I ask them, think about this: cows don't drink milk. Think about it. where do they get their calcium? They get it from the green plants that they're eating. That's where the calcium really comes from. It's in the soils and the green plants take it up. So that's why every day a healthy plant eater has some, a big helping of something dark and green on their plate. Uh, kale, chard, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, bok choy have, have those greens because a lot of calcium there. But it's in fruit, apricots have it, uh, sesame seeds have it, tahini dressing have it. There, there's calcium around. Uh, and, Osteoporosis is not a disease of calcium deficiency, despite what we're told there. It's uh, Americans eat more calcium than anyone else on planet Earth. You wouldn't think they'd have osteoporosis and it's rampant. It's mostly disuse atrophy of the bones. We've become sedentary and our bones are dissolving because we're not using them. Uh, and taking calcium pills is not going to magically make your bones stronger any more than eating brains are going to make you smarter. I mean, you, you need a little bit of calcium, uh, but get it out of the green plants. Uh, there's calcium fortified orange juice. There's lots of places to get calcium besides, uh, besides cow's milk. And the less of that you consume, the healthier you're going to be. Well, you've been, you've been I, I know you've followed your career for a long time. I know you've had many different jobs here and there and set up different practices. And, you know, this is a new day and age for the last uh, two plus years. We've, uh, had to practice in a, in a different mode because transportation has been hard, office practices have been hard. How, how have you adjusted to 
this new day and age in medicine and what kind of services do you offer to people? Oh, thank you for that remarkable question. It's remarkable because of the remarkable times we're living in. Uh, the COVID-19 virus has just uh, dented the fenders of every aspect of our modern life. It changed everything, how we eat, how we shop, how we travel, uh, everything. We all know that. And very little of it can be labeled good in any way, shape, or form. But if there's any good silver lining that's come out of this, it's the transformation that it's wrought upon the medical, uh, the practice of medicine, because it's, it's fostered the rise of telemedicine. And, uh, and uh, in recent years, um, I've gone to a completely uh, telemedicine-based practice. Uh, I've joined a, a company called Plant-Based Telemedicine, uh, run by Dr. Lori Marbus. Uh, and we offer remarkable service to help people really reverse these diseases. You know, we practice official medicine. We make diagnoses. We analyze your lab tests. We order lab studies ourselves. We can prescribe medications. It's a medical practice, but it's done through telemedicine, which lets us uh, reach people around the world. And I've got a lot of international uh, patients. I just did someone in Australia yesterday morning and Thailand uh, the day before. Uh, and if people are interested, uh, they can contact me through plant-based telehealth com plantbasedtelehealth.com. You can make an appointment. We've got 11 doctors on staff. Uh, we have licenses in all 50 states um, among the, nine, the 11 of us. So uh, we'll be able to uh, do a plant-based telemedicine uh, consultation with anybody who would like it. Yeah, I miss the, uh, directly seeing the patient in the exam room. I miss palpating abdomens and looking in ears and you know practicing hands-on medicine but I reach so many more people and, and we have such great uh, resources available to us through telemedicine that I invite people to uh, go to plantbasedtelehealth.com and uh, make an appointment be glad to see you a couple of questions for you about this kind of practice I know yeah. the kind of uh, advice that you give people uh, but how about the other 10 doctors have they gone as far as you and I have in terms of telling people that to abscond from all animal foods of any kind and to be careful about the oils and to you know, eat a bunch of potatoes. I mean, do the other 10 doctors uh, feel the same way, Michael? Uh, I can say they do. Uh, again, the name of the company is Plant-Based Telehealth. And, uh, and you can't be one of our doctors without being plant-based yourself and without advocating it. We, we meet several times a month and talk about plant-based medicine. It's, it's a plant-based telemedicine uh, practice. Well, that, that's good, that's good. I, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that they weren't recommending a lot of uh, fake, fake, fake vegan foods. Definitely not. Or, or uh, a lot of uh, nut butters and nuts and seeds. And, you know, that has a problem with overweight. The other thing I was going to ask is once somebody sees you, which sounds like a, a unique opportunity, how, uh, how in the world are you ever going to find a doctor who believes in dietary issues, who will, who's willing to reduce your medications or take you off of them? And it sounds like the 11 doctors in your group now, they provide that kind of service. How, how do you do with education as far as your clientele go? Do you have some kind of formal education for them? Yes, uh, we work closely with, uh, <clears throat> with Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute and they have a wonderful jumpstart program. I've referred patients to your 10 day uh, residential program. I've referred patients to the uh, Plant Pure Community Jumpstart program. There's lots of programs available to take people by the hand and, and walk them along those first steps uh, to a whole food plant-based lifestyle. So we certainly educate the patients. We have a vast library of handouts that we send the patient uh, after each appointment. Uh, and, uh, and we're there to answer questions. We're the uh, you know, most people are, are afraid to talk to their doctors about nutrition. And if they mention the V word, that they want to be vegan, uh, they get thrown out of the office and written off as a kook and a troublemaker. Well, I guarantee you, at our practice, you want to talk about plant-based diets, we welcome you. Uh, and we will never wag our fingers or cluck our tongues. Uh, we, we actively encourage that and because we know the power of it and we are all skilled in, in this in the discipline of deep prescribing you know and they didn't teach me that in med school but I've had to learn how to deep prescribe these medications and we do on a regular basis so uh, it's, a, it's a fun active kind of medicine to practice. Well we've had a, I had a chance to learn a lot about you Dr. Michael Clapper. <laughs> Uh, the reason, you know, the, the main impetus, not that I wouldn't enjoy a conversation with you if I had for the past 44 years, 
But uh, my focus of attention has been been redirected. Not that I don't take care of patients still, but I, I do, of course. You know, it's one of my most most enjoyable things in life is to touch people. But you know, I've been drawn to another cause, and that cause uh, is particularly because I have about five grandkids and I have three children. And that is, uh, what can we do to help the planet? Uh, just to start, let's just start talking about it in general. If you know, if you had some kind of control, what kind of things would you change? And I suppose we should just get the opposite off the table, like we'd have more efficient cars and energy supplies by sunshine and windmills. And so everybody knows that. But are there other recommendations, Dr. Michael Clapper, that you would offer the world in terms of uh, giving us a chance for a future? Because you know, the story is that half of the greenhouse gases come from the animal agriculture business. And the encouraging part is that uh, by changing your diet, you can reduce your global warming gas production by about 80%. I guess I gave part of the story away, didn't I? <laughs> oh, thank you. No, you saved me a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of explanation there. And you know, people don't appreciate. They go down to the fast food restaurant, and they mindlessly eat that burger, and they don't think about where it's really coming from and what it really costs this planet. And the reality is that we have developed this voracious, rapacious appetite for the flesh of animals, which eventually causes the medical problems that keeps you and I busy and the clogged arteries and the cancers and the autoimmune diseases. But what it does to the planet, we have, we have, there when before humans uh, started uh, destroying the planet, there were six trillion trees on planet earth. Well, we've cut down half of the trees on the planet and the land that's opened up, uh, we graze animals or, or raise corn and soybeans to shovel down their gullet. And large scale industrial animal agriculture is the main driving force for global warming. The, the trees are being cut down to make grazing land and cropland for beef. Most water is being used to irrigate alfalfa, corn and soybean fields to, for animal fodder. Most water is polluted by animal manure or herbicides and pesticides sprayed on corn and soybean fields to grow cheap cheeseburgers. This is all government subsidized through our taxes. Uh, and the uh, and every time in the restaurant we are, I'll have the beef, I'll have the veal, I'll have the chicken. Every time you say those words, your children's world gets a little hotter, a little drier, a little deader. Uh, a, the the animal based the industrial scale animal flesh production is the number one driving force uh, of all these the greenhouse gases. All these 80 billion animals, the cows, pigs, chickens that we slaughter every year, they're all breathing out carbon dioxide. They are all uh, belching out methane. They're eating grains that have been sprayed with ammonia fertilizers, outgassing nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. It's the animal agriculture driving uh, the, the global warming and the, and the climate change. But the farmers and ranchers aren't the bad guys. They're caught in the middle. They're, they're just trying to raise food and make a living. If we're paying them for the food we're eating. It's our diet creating this juggernaut of environmental destruction uh, that's you know, heading us off the cliff. Uh, and it's got to change. Uh, there's hopes that enlightened government policy will change it, but the meat and dairy and ag industries have their, their talons so tightly into government uh, policy making that it's hard to believe that they're going to start promoting, you know, subsidizing broccoli and, and fruit trees. Um, this has to come from the bottom up. Uh, we have the power because we are paying for it. We are buying this stuff. And the, the times of power is when you are in the supermarket pushing down that cart down the aisle. Uh, what you put in it determines what they produce. And if we don't buy the meat, they will stop producing it. Uh, and the same thing with the dairy and other destructive slaughter industry. Um, and the more produce that we buy, the healthier we'll be and we'll support the farmers taking care of the soils, hopefully. So, um, so we have such power to both heal ourselves from the inside and heal the planet. And the single most effective action anybody can do to 
make themselves healthier, reduce animal suffering, and preserve planet Earth is to adopt a whole food plant-based diet. There, there's no, the science is so solid, and yet you don't want to hear anything about it. Boy, they don't talk about it at the environmental meetings. They don't talk about it at COP26. Uh, whoop, it's verboten. Well, uh, what you don't know can hurt you, and this is certainly uh, hurting us. So it's up to educating the people to change what they're buying and what they're eating. The other places, of course, in the restaurant, when you're ordering that meal, uh, have, the, have the pasta with the vegetables instead of the pasta with the meat sauce. It's not that great a sacrifice, but it means that it's all the difference in the world when it comes to, the, uh, uh, to our industrial, to, uh, to our ecological fate. And we owe it to the kids. I'm working for your, I'm working for your grandchildren and the animals at this point. They're my bosses. Everything I do is to benefit your grandchildren and the animals, stop free them from these dismal factory farm existences. And so I, you start with a good example you set. People want to know what I eat. They will look at the, at the restaurant. And it's not me. All, the, all your viewers, people around you, they look at what you eat. You set the example. Well, what are you serving your family? What are you ordering in the restaurant? You, it's easy to feel overwhelmed, but you can start with your own life, make yourself healthier, and those plant-based options you choose start spreading out and it becomes the norm. And that, that's what we need to do. We need to, it's a big, tall order, but we really have no choice uh, to, to put a bow on this answer there, uh, as you said. Uh, I urge people to get this wonderful book by Glenn Mercer called Food is Climate. It's a skinny little book. You can read it in an evening. Uh, and he lays out without <laughs> hesitation, uh, not only the reality of the, the meat and uh, meat production and, and climate uh, disaster, uh, but uh, he takes on the idea that we need solar panels and electric cars as our salvation. You can put solar panels to give everybody an electric car. If we keep eating meat like we are and producing it as we do, none of it's going to make any difference. It's going to get warmer. The uh, permafrost in the, in the Siberian Arctic is going to melt, and we all have uh, irreversible problems at that point. So it's the hope. And uh, my job, and I know your job, is to, uh, is to promulgate this among the public. Uh, the, when, uh, the, the uh, the, pub, the politicians will follow when the, when the public changes what they buy and what they use. So you're suggesting a, a bottom-up approach. Uh, about, yes. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Do you have any, and I agree, I, I want to talk to you about the bottom-up approach in just a minute, but do you have any uh, hope for a top-down approach? You mentioned government, and I think you alluded to, to superstars in the movie and the and another celebrity interest. Uh, do, do you have any hope that we will get some sympathy from the US government, the Chinese government, the Russian government? I mean, it's affecting everybody on the planet. Or do you see a superstar you know, rising uh, up and, 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 and because of their celebrity power, dictating that we need to change? Those are all possibilities, and I'm open to. I'm welcoming any help from any quarter. And a uh, and, and and but seriously, well, you raise a very important question. There's a, such a void of leadership. Uh, what what's uh, what three or four powerful celebrities and politicians could do? What uh, Oprah Winfrey and Mayor Eric Adams and Tim Cook from Apple? What what, what they could do if they called things for what they really are and stop beating around the bush. And I'm afraid there I'll lose subscribers if I say the meat's not good. The truth is the truth. We don't have time any longer for, for political politeness at this point. Uh, they say you can't keep a hat pin, and people remember what hat pins are, in a cloth bag for very long. You know, the point comes out and, and the point of our meat eating is coming out. Uh, and some leadership would be most welcome. And, and I hope these stars start stepping forward, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, any of them. Yes, that would be nice, but we can't hold our breath. Um, the, uh, 
big ag, you know, gets billions of dollars in subsidies uh, from the federal government, from our taxes every year to, to lower the cost of the corn and the soybeans and artificially lower the cost of meat. We should, people should write their congressmen, stop these subsidies to agriculture. Let the people, you know, the, especially our friends on the right say, let the market determine uh, the truth of uh, commodities. Well, then let them do that when it comes to corn and soybeans and meat. And meat would sell for $90 a pound if it really uh, uh, sold for what it costs to produce it. So write your congressman, stop the agricultural subsidies when the farm bill comes up. People could certainly uh, do that. Uh, but again, uh, it's, uh, that's a tall mountain to climb, but we, we, we still need to climb it. But again, because you know they're producing these plant-based fake meats, um, and no one's saying they're healthy and they're, they are processed and they have salt and saturated fat, et cetera. But they don't have cholesterol or pesticides and there's no uh, animal suffering involved and there's a whole lot less meat, uh, uh, water and soils, et cetera, used up to produce them. Um, <clears throat> I hear that China, uh, who is going to um, uh, who is, is going to, uh, importing all this American corn and grains to shovel down the gullets of these millions of pigs that people that the Chinese people eat? Well, they're going to the plant-based pork uh, you know, for economic reasons, not because they feel sorry for the pigs. Uh, but that's a boy. If China changes, oh, a lot of things are going to change. Uh, they own Smithfield Farms that makes most of the American pigs. That that would change. The, the wheels are, are starting to turn and the economics make plant-based diets so much more favorable. It's expensive and wasteful to shovel your grains down the gullets of animals who then poop most of it out as manure or burn most of it off as heat. Uh, it's so inefficient. Grow the plants directly and feed the, the plants to the people and you'll need a lot less land. The forests will come back. And as the trees grow, they take carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into solid wood, and it reverses global warming. It's the key to everything. So eat plants, and we'll have a future. Well, not, not to get on the political front or um, to cause anybody to be concerned about saying a nice thing about China, but the Chinese government uh, instituted dietary guidelines that recommend half the meat for the Chinese people compared to the US dietary guidelines. So, you know, there, there are some important thinkers around the world in different countries with different politics and we all have to join together. And uh, I, I can understand and see that you're just as frustrated as I am by the lack of leadership. And, you know, they must have children and grandchildren too. You know, how, how can they be uh, blind to the fact that uh, there's so much at stake but that brings me back to the second part of my question, and that is that you and I both know, or at least we've been relegated to the idea that we have to do this from the bottom up. We've got to change, I don't know, 750 million people, 10% of the population, you know, certainly not three and a half billion people. I don't know. We've got to make some kind of dent so that we're heard. How, how do we get enough people, Michael? Do you have any thoughts on changing this from an occasional patient that you can you can get to come and see you in your practice and the occasional patients that I can they can I have come and see me how, how do we get Michael I want to tell you we've known each other for almost 40 years and I, I when I discovered this and I would guess that you had a similar feeling when I, when I discovered this such a simple answer to solving so many health problems I thought people would be lining out outside my door for miles to get in and see me. It hasn't happened. I don't think I, it's happened to you either. Where no. are those miles and droves of people wanting to get cured? Much less think, save the planet. You would think, yeah, our friend Dean Ornish, same thing. He showed that heart disease can reverse. He was sure that all the cardiologists would be calling him. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who reversed heart disease. He's sure that all the cardiologists, crickets and uh, they don't want to hear that they don't want to open the door to that uh, they're goodbye to their t-bone steaks goodbye to their uh, to their patients if everybody gets healthy who's going to need these bypasses uh, and i don't want to impugn their, i'm sure all the doctors want their patients to be healthy yeah, but right. there's a whole lot of resistance a whole lot of inertia to keep things going like like it's been going uh, so so what's the hope 
uh, two things that give me hope are young people and the internet. And uh, you can change a whole lot of people and the kids are, the, they know something's up. They know environmentally, the, the things look bleak. And the words getting around about plant-based diets, about going vegan, and more and more of the young people are going vegan, and they're the ones who really ultimately count. And um, and and how do you reach them? There's these wonderful documentaries now that are coming up. Plant-based news is a wonderful website. Uh, urge you to subscribe to it. Uh, uh, they, 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 and because they advertise these remarkable documentaries uh, that spell out, if you haven't seen Seaspiracy, see that film. It, uh, the, it's the reality of where fish really is, are coming from or where they're going. Um, so young people, the internet and educating them through documentaries and, and podcasts, etc., cetera, uh, are the way till it just permeates into the point where when one of them orders a, uh, you know, some, I, I, when I talk to the young kids, I say, if, if one of your, your, your friends pulled out a cigarette and lit up, what, what would you say? Are you still doing that, man? Really? In this day and age? Well, we want to get to the point where order, ordering a cheeseburger or a beef burger gets the same reaction. Man, are you still eating that stuff? Don't you know what that does to our future? You know, that's what we've got to get coming out of the lips of our young people. And uh, so that's where I'm focusing a lot of my uh, attention. And the other places in our colleagues' mouths, what if all the doctors were recommending plant-based diets and you and I do decry the absence of that? Well, I've been going around to the medical schools because uh, if I can reach the first, second, third year med students and tell them plant-based diets will reverse these diseases that you're gonna be spending the majority of your professional time treating, uh, get that message early in their medical career, they'll be more open to the message. So we've been doing our Moving Medicine Forward initiative to, to reach the medical students, and we're reaching more and more of them now. We just hired a full-time person. So, um, so I'm, there, there's acupuncture points around the medical students, the young people, the documentaries. we got to work those points uh, until finally we hit that critical mass where, of course, you know, it becomes accepted. Well, of course, we plant-based. You know, what, what's... Well, what's new? And that, that's, at that stage, we'll have accomplished our mission. Well, I, I do want to emphasize one of the great contributions that you've been making, Michael Clapper. And that is you've been, you know, before the pandemic, you were going around physically to medical schools and talking to young doctors whose minds can still be molded in the right direction. And now I assume you're doing that through internet uh, lectures to these uh, similar organizations. And the students are receptive, aren't they? The very receptive. In every medical school class now, there's 30, 40 students. They've seen forks over knives. They've seen what the health, they, the, the light's already on. They have lifestyle medicine interest groups and in, already established in most of these med schools. And so I appear now electronically saying, yes, this is the way of the future. You want to heal these patients or don't you? You want to heal them? Then get real about why they're sitting in front of you, overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, clogged up and inflamed from what they've been eating. Get these folks on a plant-based diet and you too will become the happiest doctor you know. You'll, your patients will get healthier right before your eyes. And so uh, they've been very receptive to this. And uh, as I said, we've hired a full-time person now to, after I give the lecture in the med school, to follow up, uh, do plant-based journal clubs, do uh, show movies, bring in guest speakers. We want to keep that plant-based flame of interest going at these med schools. And so uh, we're working to, uh, uh, to get actually questions on the national board exams about plant-based diets. And then they'll take, it, take the subject seriously there. So we're working hard on that front, and that's the, that's, that's the acupuncture point I can work on specifically, but there's so many other folks doing wonderful work on the internet. Rich Roll's doing great plant-based podcasts. Uh, we're trying to permeate into the society fabric uh, the importance of plant-based diets, plant-based nutrition. It really is not only the hope, it's the only hope. No, I wanna emphasize a couple of points you made, uh, Dr. Michael Clapper. You know, one is that uh, the, the purpose of medical schools is to get the students to pass the boards. So if you get board questions about nutrition, then they're going to put classes in about nutrition. And right now they don't because there aren't, they aren't held to understanding that, uh, that diet is crucial in preventing and curing diseases. And uh, the other thing is, is and I don't know that we've overcome this, Michael, is that 
there's a great attraction to specialties because specialties make all the money. So a, a bypass surgeon or a cardiologist may make a half a million a year, whereas a general doctor may make 150,000 or $200,000 a year. And as a result, 90% of the students, the last figures I got, around 90% of them were going into specialties and not into general work where they'd have a chance to talk to their people about diet. How about overcoming that? How do you make it more attractive to young, you gotta pay them more. We get, we gotta start, we gotta start <laughs> making uh, diet therapy a subspecialty and pay them three quarters of a million dollars a year to do that. That's how we do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because really the, the um, um, it's when you bring in the money, it's such an issue. I I was on a I was on the cardiovascular anesthesia service, uh, and I we did a patient overweight fellow did a four vessel uh, coronary artery bypass. Uh, he had a terrible post op course. He had a wound infection, a wound dehiscence. Got post op pneumonia. Uh, it, he limped out of that coronary care unit about almost two months later. Generated a million dollars in bills and and headed right to the uh, to the steakhouse um, to start eating uh, uh, steaks and then back to the rib place that he loved so much uh, to do ribs and celebration. And, and he wound up, of course, needing another bypass uh, a couple of years later. The, and this is money thrown away. That The money that could be saved if that man had just had one session with a plant-based dietitian change his diet and change his life, that money that's saved could be used to, to pay primary care doctors or to subsidize medical students. We, we got The bean counters need to change the way the beans are flowing and reward the primary care doctors for doing plant-based counseling. The money there, we just need to change, uh, give the primary care docs access to it and reward them for this life-saving counseling. Well, I, I want to be clear and I want everybody to appreciate your contribution, Dr. Michael Clapper. Not only are you seeing the individual patients, but you're going around to medical schools and talking to students and residents and young doctors, young thinking doctors, to get them to make a change. And it would make all the difference in the world for your doctor to say, you know, this is important, and maybe to add a little bit about the planet. And uh, so you are making a difference from the bottom up, and, and I think you're unique in doing that, uh, Dr. Michael Clapper, and going out and, and dealing with uh, some of the forces that could make a huge difference. Have you gotten involved with politicians or celebrities yet? Uh, we uh, I run into them from time to time, and uh... Uh, if people like to know more about what we're doing, go to my website, drclapper.com. I'm sure uh, Dr. McDougall will have this in the show notes and click on moving medicine forward. You'll see what we're doing as well as yeah. make a, a contribution if you'd like. Um, we yeah, I run into the occasional, um, I've become good friends uh, with uh, Penn Gillette, uh, oh, uh, sure, sure. right? And uh, Penn's been, been a booster. Uh, and um, John Stewart uh, from The Daily Show uh, has become a friend and, uh, and a supporter. And um, uh, they often don't say a lot outside, but uh, in their hearts, they know that, that this is really important. So they've been very supportive and I'm sure more will come along as, uh, as the word gets out. Well, it's, it's always a problem, whether you're a medical doctor or a celebrity or a politician, of balancing things so that the public and the general public doesn't believe in what we have to say to be true or important. You're afraid of, uh, of being fired from your job. And uh, it's, it's, it'll take some people that are willing to step beyond that. Like, I know you're that kind of person, Michael, that are uh, willing and able in a situation where they can do the right thing without worrying about the prejudice out there that's in the community. Uh, any other thoughts before we close on uh, how we fix the planet? I, you really imparted some very important practical information during this, this time we've had together. I just don't wanna cut you short, but I also, uh, I also appreciate the fact that you've given us some very powerful tools. Thank any you. other thoughts on what we ought to be doing? Yes, uh, this is no time to lose hope. This is time for action. The, the kids are dependent upon it. We plundered their world. We owe it to the kids. We owe it to the animals. We owe it to the planet. And it starts with what you're having for dinner tonight. Every meal makes a difference. Every plant-based meal heals 
the planet it heals you it heals the, the animals heals everything it, it makes a difference now and it doesn't matter what people say in the sidelines in the peanut gallery do what you know in your heart is right and the, we are plant eating creatures we have fingers on our hands not claws We've got small mouths and flat grinding molar teeth for chewing up roots and starches and fruits. Uh, we are plant eating hominids. Honor that. You will be rewarded with a lean, healthy body. Uh, I will keep you out of the clutches of people like Dr. McDougall and me. And, uh, and you'll be creating a world that your children could live in that, uh, that this, the, the animals are innocent. They've been here for millions of years. We have no right to plunder their home and plunder them. Uh, they are fellow travelers on this magical spaceship that we're finding ourselves in. We, uh, we owe it to life itself with a capital L to take care of it. Ahimsa is a beautiful concept. It means intentionally not doing harm to any other living creature, including the non-human ones. Live a life guided by the concept of ahimsa, of, of harmlessness, uh, and starting, and that includes the food that you're eating for lunch, and everything will get better from there. And again, don't underestimate the power of your example to influence the people around you. It's going to get less and less strange. It's going to get more and more commonplace. And, uh, and you'll go to bed at night with a clear conscience that you haven't caused unnecessary suffering to any animals and you've helped heal the world in the future. So, so adopt a plant-based diet and everything will get better from there. Well, as you speak these words, I realize that I've gone through this uh, evolution in consciousness. You know, I started out only caring about treating my patients and I had my eyes opened as far as animal cruelty is concerned. And my eyes have been opened as far as the planetary issues are concerned. So I can see that even in myself, I've grown. The question is, can we evolve the entire population of the planet or the majority of powerful people quick enough to your understanding about the importance of the planet and the animals? Can we do it quick enough? Well, and, uh, you... The reason for this interview, uh, Dr. Michael Clapper, is is uh, to present you to a whole different audience. Uh, I've just launched a website which is mcdougallfoundation.org, which is totally dedicated to dietary therapy for one individual, and that's planet Earth. I don't know what, quite what to call him or her, but diet therapy for planet Earth. And uh, your positive message, as well as many other experts are going to appear on this website. It's the mcdougallfoundation.org, nonprofit, uh, fully intended to make a difference fully intended to get an attention of people. And I know that the interview that we just did together is gonna to get a lot of people's attention. Maybe you'll get maybe you'll get those politicians and those celebrities calling you up. But yeah, I think yeah. that what you're doing from the ground up is just crucial, Dr. Michael Clapper. And could you give us one more time how people can get a hold of you? Yes, um, go to my website, drclapper.com. It's all spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-K-L-A-P-E-R.com. And uh, you'll see what we're doing there. Click on Moving Medicine Forward. And we do once a month, we do a uh, plant-based clinical nutrition uh, uh, forum. Uh, in fact, Dr. McDougall is going to be our guest in May. And so I invite everyone to join us once a month for our plant-based clinical nutrition forum. But go to my website, drclapper.com. I also have a YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Clapper. So I'd love to see you there. We do lots of Q&As there. Uh, but it's all the same message. Eat plants, get healthy, and save the world. Well, thank you, Dr. Michael Clapper, for making this contribution. And I know, I know you'll help make a difference. We'll get our hand waving up there as loud as we can so people notice us. And they're going to pay attention, no question about it. We are entirely optimistic about what we can do. Thank no you, John. It's been an honor to be your, your friend and colleague for all these decades, and you are continuing to do the work and getting the word out. And, and uh, there's nothing else to do at this point, but keep doing this work and uh, assume things are going to get better. So thank you so much, my friend. And thank you, Michael Clapper. I'm Dr. John McDougall, and thank you very much for listening.